graveyard shift. Clean up, okay. I like clean up better. I did think of that. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, this is, it's different. It's a lot lower, but it's nice. There's a lot of room here for a bottle of water and maybe another bottle over here. Yeah, a couple ballpoint points. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> well, it's nice to see everyone here. So a lot of people still hung around. Good for you. And you guys don't look too tired either. Well, a few of you look a little tired, but <laughs> it's been a long weekend. It's been fun, but it's tiring. So I'll try not to go too long. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1. And uh, <clears throat> I initially started looking at 1 Corinthians 1, and I was looking at just a couple verses, and then I started looking at the context in the whole chapter, and I realized I'll just try to do the whole chapter and kind of hit some high points as, as opposed to just one verse. So um, we'll start by reading 1 Corinthians 1, and uh, we're going to break in halfway through and, and do the second half of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Start in verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdoms of, wisdom of words, lest the, Christ, the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in, his, in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time where we can come and study and the, the privilege to preach your word and, uh, and do that freely without uh, fear of persecution. And uh, we just pray that we take your word today and we look at it with an open heart and we let your spirit work in us and allow it to edify us and build us up. Amen. So <clears throat> to start out with... Um, just a little background on Corinthians. Um, I was doing some, just looking online a little bit about the history of Corinth, and I thought it was interesting, personally myself, with relation to what you read about in Corinth and a lot of the problems they had. So I just wanted to read a few things about them. Um, the, the, the Corinth, the city itself, is, it was a, a high traffic. It was a city of commerce, and, and it had a lot of wealth. It was where it was located. People would, instead of sailing around the peninsula, they would just go right through it. So it was a port, and they had a port on both sides. So you had a lot of commerce, a lot of trade. And because of that, you also had a lot of different nationalities, a lot of different people coming through. It was also right next to Athens. So with that, what do you get with Athens? Everyone knows what, what's there, right? You get the philosophy, right? And all, all of the humo, uh, uh, man's intellectual wisdom. <clears throat> um, the religion... Well, there was a lot of religions because of all the different people there. But the primary one um, that, that, center, that Corinth centered around was the goddess Aphrodite, which would be similar to Rome, Rome's Venus. Uh, a, god, a goddess of beauty and love and, and more specific, specifically sensual love. The goddess's main synagogue and surrounding temples in Corinth employed more than 1,000 temple prostitutes is what, what they predict. Um, so this wasn't just a, god, a, a goddess of love, but this was a god of, of fornication. You know, this was lascivious love. This was not good love. And that's what it was centered around. And when you think about the Corinthians and some of the struggles they had, I think that's pretty significant when you see them struggling with some of those issues. <clears throat> so it's good for us to understand that when we see, see how the Corinthians st stumbled with that. But it's also interesting to recognize that even in a, in a corrupt city like that, with all that horrible stuff going on, you can see a church and see God's grace and that light still in a city, and them functioning. 
Um, the state of the, the church of Corinth, when you read through 1 Corinthians, you see a, a lot of bad stuff. You know, we, when we want to show a bad example in the scripture, usually we go to 1 Corinthians because they, they got a lot of them, you know. Um, <clears throat> you know, you look at what they were, were dealing with, and, and the church today resembles a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, there were be- believers who were superficial. Um, they valued the eloquent, eloquent speech and human wisdom over actually God's word. Uh, Paul says to him in 1 Corinthians 3, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes in Christ. The Corinthians church, their moral compass was way off, right? They made even the heathen pagans around them blush. In 1 Corinthians 5, it, it says that the things that you're doing aren't even main, named among the Gentiles. Uh, they were full of contention, division. They cared about the name, the pedigree of the person. You see that in 1 Corinthians 1 with all the different with, uh, people there. Uh, They were puffed up with knowledge. They lacked doctrinal understanding. They they lacked God's wisdom. They lacked charity. Paul labored among them for years, and they never thought a need to give to him financially to support him. Uh, And above that, they despised Paul and his ministry. They questioned his authority. They questioned his motives. Uh, Alex talked about that this morning, and he had to constantly reaffirm who he was and his authority. And yet through all of that, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Through all of that, all those bad things, what does Paul say to him here in 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 2? Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. He still calls them saints, doesn't he? He still calls them sanctified. In chapter 6, he lists just as many horrible things, and what does he say? And such were some of you, right? But now ye are washed. Now ye ye are sanctified, right? And that's important for us to know that no matter where we are on the scale, no matter where we see other people at, a saint's a saint, a brother's a brother. And that's the way we need to approach them, the way God sees them and views them as in Christ. And that's really the point of chapter 1 here when he starts out with. If you look at verse 11, you think of all these horrible things that the Corinthians are struggling with, you know, giving up this paganism that they've been saturated in for so long and struggling with human wisdom. Verse 11 kind of sums it up. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Where does Proverbs say contention comes from? Pride. Right? By pride cometh contention. So there's the problem right there, the core issue with with Corinth. And when you go through chapter 1 here, you start to see a difference between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. And you see pride is, is the root core of that, of that issue, the problem with what they're dealing with. So like I said, I'm not, I'm not planning on looking at everything today, uh, but I want to spend some time looking at God's wisdom and man's wisdom, which is a lot of what's talked about here. And then I want, I want us as believers to recognize the, not only the importance for us personally, but for, for the ministry and the future of the ministry to not get wrapped up in man's wisdom. There is no benefit in that wisdom. And you see in church today where you see that creeping in. You know, mainstream Christianity today, they they like to bring that in because they think, well, we can get more people into the doors and we can get more people saved. But see, when you start bringing that in and you start taking the the, the doctrine committed to Paul, that starts to go on the back burner. And before you know it, you're not even preaching the gospel anymore. You're just bringing people in and making them feel good. So uh, let's start in in chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's look at man's wisdom and God's wisdom here. So we'll start with man's wisdom. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So in verse 21 there, where, where do we read about, read about in Paul's epistles where it talks about God's wisdom and man rejecting God's wisdom? Romans chapter 1, right? Go back to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, you see a little more detail when it comes to man and their response to God. Romans 1 verse 18 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So first of all, how many times do you witness to someone or you hear people talking on the radio or on the news or on TV and they say, well, man doesn't have the truth and man can't know the truth and all, your best chance is to bump into it, right? That's an excuse. The Bible says man knows the truth. Not only does man know the truth, they hold the truth, right? Verse 19 and 20 explains how we have an inward proof. We have an outward proof, right? We know there's a God. The God who created the universe, that created us, created us to know that there's a God. It'd be pretty silly if he didn't do that, wouldn't it? If he created us and then just left us for, for our own to, to try to find him, right? Um, look at verse 21, Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1, what does he say about man's wisdom? It's foolishness, right? So how, do you go, how does man go from having the truth, holding it, and end up in foolish, right? And in, in chapter 1 here, you get some of those points, and I just want to spend a little more time looking at those. So we're going to run some verses just real quick. Um, but at the end of verse 21, what is darkened? Their foolish heart was darkened, right? What do we know about man's heart? It's wicked, right? Turn to Genesis chapter 6. First, you know, the first occurrence principle in the Bible, you'll go and look at where the, the word first occurs. Genesis 6 is the first one about the heart. Genesis 6, 5. And this is at a point where mankind's going down the drain pretty fast, right before the flood here, and he realizes he has to do something. Genesis 6. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil sometimes, but they did their best. All the time, right? You go out today in the world, say you go out to your workplace, and you ask someone the question about, about their heart. Are you a good person? 99% of them are going to say what? I do my best. I'm a pretty good person, right? You go to college today. What are they going to say? I'm a pretty good person. What do they teach today? Whatever you feel in your heart is right, right? Whatever makes you happy is okay, right? Whatever you feel in your heart. You go to high school today. You talk to kids today as they grow up, and they're learning that now. The culture has changed. It's not like it used to be. You know, people grew up in the Bible. They grew up going to church every day. You go to most churches today, how many people do you think understand that about their heart? You think a lot of the churches today would think their heart's okay? Right? Well, if, if they tell you to give your heart over to Jesus, you must think it's pretty good if you're going to give it to the holy, righteous judge, aren't you? Right? That shows how, how much this has crept into Christendom today, right? So turn, um, so in Romans so just how do you go, how do you get from having God's truth to denying his truth? Romans 1, eight we know they held the truth, right? Romans one twenty one it says they rejected it, right? Now Romans 1, we're talking about unsaved man, right? The Gentiles, it talks about how they gave, God gave them up. He gave them over, right? Turn to Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23, it's talking about Israel, right? God's chosen people, right? They had God's word. They had God on their side, right? What did God say? If you listen to me, you obey me, I'm going to bless you, right? Before that, actually, before they even had the law, what did they do in Exodus? They didn't have to do any of that. They just had to follow along. Anything they needed, God gave them, right? Jehovah God, I am, right? You need water, I got it. You need food, I got it. You need redemption from your enemies, I can take care of it. They get God's law because they think they can do better, right? Jeremiah seven twenty three, But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsel and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward, not forward. Doesn't that sound just like Romans 1? We've got God's chosen people here, right? They got God's word. They got God on their side, right? Doing the same thing. 
They're still choosing to rely on themselves. There's no excuse there. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. So they have the truth. They reject the truth. So what do they do? What is, what is it? And Jeremiah there kind of hinted at what did they do? What did they do instead of looking towards God and his wisdom? They look inward, right? They look at their heart. Colossians chapter 2. Paul's warning the Colossians here of this philosophy, this human wisdom. Don't let it creep into your church. Don't let this be, be what you start to, to listen to. Verse 7. Rooted and built up and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. What two categories are there? You see, you see Christ's wisdom, and who else's wisdom do you see there? Who else's idea? Man's, right? It's either, it's either man's or it's Christ's. It's either man's or it's God's, right? There's no gray area. And as soon as you start getting around and you start messing around with getting a little bit of the human wisdom in, mixed in with it because you think it's going to help you get more people saved or you think it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring more people into the door, right? You're, you're losing the battle. Satan's winning. That's what he wants. What, is, what did Satan do in Genesis 3? Was it, was it a little change or a big change, right? It's a little change. But it meant a lot, didn't it? He left out freely, one word. Freely is a big word, though. It means a lot, doesn't it? How are we saved today? Free, right? But how many people say that in church? Maybe they just add, well, you know, turn your life over to Jesus and he'll save you, right? Pray in your heart to Jesus and he'll save you, right? Doesn't have to be a lot to make it wrong. So man decides to establish their own wisdom. They establish their own standards. They choose to reject God's. And they're going in their heart, Proverbs 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Grab Isaiah chapter 5 as well. Proverbs 28 and Isaiah chapter 5. Proverbs 28, verse, um, look at verse 25. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whosoever walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. So what happens, what happens to man when he decides to go inward to his heart and he establishes his own ideas, his own beliefs, his own system? He's a fool, right? And then what does a fool say in Psalms 53? A fool says in his heart, there is no God, right? So when you got someone out there professing to be an atheist and they say there is no God, they're a fool. And that's not being mean. That's, that's speaking the truth, because that's what God said it is. And they didn't start out that way. No one starts out an atheist. You ask a little kid, you know, what is this? What's the earth? Who made the trees? They're going to say God. You have a natural understanding in you when you're born that you, under, you see that. But see, what happens is over time is you, you start to choose, choose to reject that, because that's what your sin nature does. Your sin nature says, I can do it better. That's good, God. You've got your plan. You've got a design. But I'm going to try to do it this way. I'm going to do it my own way. In Jeremiah 17, it says that man, man's trust in his arm, in his might. And they reject God. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know what happens when you go into your heart and you try to just make your own concoction of what you think truth is and what wisdom is, you're a fool, and you're just doing the opposite of what God says because you're choosing to reject what he says. And you want to get as far away from that truth as you can. You think of evolution. 
is evolution or is it de-evolution? Are they completely opposite of what the truth is, right? They're saying we're evolving still, right? If you look around at creation, do you see evolution? Does it look like things are getting better, right? You know, we got this church here, and it's getting old, and you go out and you look at the outside of it, and it's crumbling. It's not getting better. If it was getting better and fixing itself, that would be great. It would, it would help out with the, with the bills, right? But it doesn't. Things get old. They don't get better. But see, man, they, they convince themselves. And that's the problem. That's, pride is scary. Because, see, pride, you get in yourself. And you start thinking in your head, how do I make this work? And before you know it, you've convinced yourself that you're right. And you're a fool. You're totally wrong. And you are dead set that you're right. So how, how do you not do that, right? That's why we have this, right? There's a standard of right. There's a standard of true wisdom, true knowledge. It's God's word, not man. But see, our society is not going that way. Our society is doing what, what, it, what, the, what in, in Israel did. You go back to the book of Judges, and what does it say that they did? Every man did what was right in his own eyes, right? And how did that work for him, right? And how and did, did they learn? Just kept doing it over and over again, right? We don't want to go inward to our heart to make the plans, to, to figure out what's right. Use our wisdom. Alex did some, a couple years ago, he did a, a survey, uh, a science survey. And I'm just going to steal one of the points he had. There was a survey done in the U.S. back, I think it was in the 90s, the U.S. National Academy of Scientists. 93% of them believed that there was no God. So if you've got scientists today, and what are they looking at? What are they viewing? Science is, you're, you're observing, right? You're observing what is in front of you. So if they're observing creation, and they're coming at it with the, already the false premise that there's no God, what, so what are they going to come up with? They've got to say, okay, well, there's no God, so it can't be that. So I'm going to have to make my own plan. And a random big bang a couple billion years ago is the best I can come up with, right? I mean, really? I mean, that... that you will, people say, oh, you believe in a God? He, he wrote you a, a Bible? It's just, it's just a bunch of fables and good stories and some good moral stuff. And, you know, it's good to, to try to live by and you learn some good stories, but it's nothing more than that. No. <laughs> and, but you're going to believe, you, remember, who, uh, what was the movie that Ben Stein did? Do you guys remember that movie? Expel no Expelled. Wow. Remember, when, remember when he was talking to Dawkins at the end? What did he say? What did he, uh, finally, he got him to say, because he kept saying, well, matter came from this, or, or this, there was this pool out in space. And, he, and then he said, well, where'd the pool come from? Well, the pool came from particles that were floating for billions. Well, where did the particles come from that were floating, right? And he eventually got him to, to, to say, well, there was probably a higher life form like an alien that like planted a seed that grew into this earth that we have. You're telling me that that's easier to swallow than just believing Genesis 1-1? Right? But see, what do we do? What, do, what does Christian, Christianity do a lot of times when it comes to this? You know, you've got creation science. Now, as a believer, you see some of that stuff, and it's exciting because you understand that God created the world, right? You understand his, his, his plan and his genius plan, and you can appreciate it. But see, the people that are rejecting God, you can talk to your blue in the face about that. They're going to just keep taking that information you're giving them, and they're going to keep flipping it around. It's a waste of time. Because that's not what they're interested in. All you need to say to them is, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. That's why I believe it. I don't need to give you a list of things. God said it in his word, and that's good enough for me. You know, who was here last night for John's message? You know, he started it out with, that, with sharing the gospel, right? That was a good gospel, wasn't it? Do you remember what he did? Did he get into a bunch of philosophy and a cool little presentation? Did he try to convince you of a, an atheist and go into all of their different um, ideas of what that is? What did he say? It says here that you're in trouble. And you can choose to not believe that if you want, but that doesn't change the result. That doesn't change what's going to happen to you if you don't trust, trust in Christ and his shed blood. Right? I mean, that was pretty, that's straightforward. That's the way you share the gospel, right? So man rejects, rejects his word. You know, you think of the, the Bible critics, and, and Brian gave that, that message on the Paulicians. 
And for people to say, well, it's just a book and it's not that important and it's, you know, it's probably kind of God's word, but a lot of it's just some cool stories people came up with. Did the Pauliceans think that? Did hundreds and thousands of Christians die for just some book? For with Lord of the Rings, is that what this is, you know? Come on, Lord of the Rings stole half their stuff from here, you know that. You go through the Old Testament, any new movie you see or sci-fi or fantasy movie, half the stuff comes from God's, God's word, right? It's, it's serious. And see, you see the Pauliceans die, be persecuted, and moved out. And you realize that, and you, you see that they believed what we believed. And, you, and before, you, sometimes you think, well, we're just like a dot in history. Where we're, we're, we're rightly dividers before us, right? We're not just a dot in history. We're, we're an extension of a line, a line of truth, since Paul wrote it. See, and so that, that should scare you. Because that means it's our responsibility to continue that on. That's what all these guys are talking about all weekend. Look, we got to stand fast. We can't, we can't deviate from the truth. Because if we deviate from the truth, where's it going to go? It's our responsibility to carry that on. Um, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So man chooses to go inward, right? They rely on their human wisdom. They decide what they want to do. They're fools, right? They reject God. You know, in, in Ephesians 4, it talks about how, well, in Romans 1, 21, it talks about how their foolish heart was darkened, right? Roman, Ephesians 4 talks about how the vanity of their mind, right? See, they're filling their, they're filling their mind up, but it's all emptiness, and it's all darkness, right? There's no light there. Job Remember what Job said to his friends in chapter 38? Who is this that darkeneth counsel with words of knowledge, right? And what were, what were those friends doing? What was their wisdom? It's human wisdom, right? Did that, did, that, did that shed any light on his problem? Just darkened it, right? Just muddied it up. Um, turn to, uh, you're in 1 Corinthians 1, right? All right, I got to get there. You know, having... Having kids, it really changes your perspective on life. Before having kids, you kind of, you know, you you, you kind of own the, the message and you care about it. But boy, when you have kids and you realize that you're responsible, you're responsible to now teach them that truth. That's scary. <laughs> that's a lot of work. That's a big responsibility. You know, and I'm I pray all the time. I'm so thankful for the guys here at the church, the the older gentlemen here, and my parents and in laws that. You know, the wisdom that they can give us, having a, having a generation before me that understood that, you know, and, and thought that way. But, you know, one thing I thought about when, to instill in my kids is that today no one thinks there's an absolute truth. Everything is subjective to your feelings and to your heart. Everyone lives that way nowadays. So to, to teach your children at a young age, there is a right and wrong. You know, you don't want to always... Your kids are telling you, like, well, Daddy, why this? Daddy, why that? And after a while, you go, what, what do you say when your kids keep asking you over and over again? Because I said so. Knock it off, right? But, you know, what if you say, because God said so? And let me show you why. So you, don't, you know why you obey me? Because God says children obey your parents. And you know why you're supposed to obey your parents? Because it's my responsibility to teach you and train you in the right ways. Because that's what God tells me to do. You see, I'm not making the rules either. There's someone above me, right? I'm obeying God's word too. I'm not above the law, right? Not the law, grace, right? <laughs> you get what I'm saying, right? Before someone says I'm preaching the law up here, provoking my children to wrath, right? <laughs> all right. Um, so that's man's wisdom, right? There's no benefit there. It's all vain. It's all emptiness. So what, what about God's wisdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Where is the power of God today? Preaching of the cross, right? And how do we know that that's the preaching of the cross, cross is where the power is today? It's what it says in his word, right? So what does God want us to do with his wisdom? What are we supposed to do when we read what God tells us? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? You don't need to figure it out for yourself. You don't need to rationalize it in your head. Now, God's not saying be, you know, just a blind bat and flying backwards in a dark cave. 
I got his attention. Look at that. It's pretty good, right? He wants you to pay attention, right? He wants you to think and use your noggin, right? But use his wisdom, right? Use his knowledge. Um, turn to First Thessalonians chapter 2. Finally, I finally was able to put in one of his little sayings. I've always thought I should do that, and I just never... It came naturally, though, just like that. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, a good example of how this works. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. That's what they did, right? They didn't take, hear it and then say, well, but you know, Plato says this, or, you know, this guy over here says that. They, they, they heard God's word and said, that's God's word, I'm going to believe that, right? The Bereans did that too, and what did they do? They searched it out, right? Did they search it out by going to some human man's writing, man's wisdom? What did they do? They searched the scriptures, right? Again, that's where our truth is to be found. That's where our faith rests in, is God's word. So God's wisdom. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we'll go back to chapter 1. I want to say something about the last few verses there towards the end. But for right now in chapter 2, is where Paul starts to kind of talk about God's wisdom. Why, why are we trusting in his wisdom? Why is it superior than man's, you know? And in, uh, chap, in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 24 there and down, it's, it's kind of talking about he's using the weak things, right, to beat the world, right? It's like he's, he's just using his little pinky to beat Satan kind of thing, right? Chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What is he telling them to rest in? God's word, right? What are you doing going over here and looking into human wisdom? You know, in, in chapter 1, they're, they're focusing on, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Who are they focused on if they're naming guys? When you share the gospel with people today, I've noticed that there's guys, you'll ask them, well, do you read your Bible much? Well, no, not a lot, but I got this really good book by so-and-so, and he says this, and this guy, you know, this guy's really got some nice things to say, and I just like the way he's, he pre preaches, you know, and and this guy was, uh, has a Ph.D. and ABC and a bunch of other letters after his name. And he went to college and he went to seminary school. And what are you doing? Who are you relying on then if that's what you're focused on? It's man wisdom, right? Now, they're using God's word still, right? But, it's, but see, you can use God's word and add all the, all the human wisdom you want to it. And you can just kind of mask over the real truth. You can mask over the power that's in the cross. Uh, verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And, you, and Paul just gives you an example. Here's, here's, a big, here's God's wisdom, right? Even Satan didn't see this coming. I just figured out how to save not only my people, the Jews, but now a whole new dispensation, a whole new way of now saving the Gentiles. Everyone on the same field, same level playing field. And now I can reclaim the heavens and the earth, right? Amen. And would Satan have crucified Christ if he knew that's what was going to happen? No. But, but what was the problem with Satan? Pride. Pride, right? Remember in Ezekiel 28, he says, Thou art wiser than Daniel, right? He thought he was a pretty cool guy. He thought he knew everything, right? And what does God say? I didn't tell you everything. I kept something secret, right? And here it is. So now what do, what do we know with that knowledge now? You know, you, you read Ephesians 3 and you realize Paul's been given this special, distinct message of, of grace. He's our apostle to the Gentiles. Talks about the manifold wisdom of God, right? Look, we already know how the story ends, right? God wins, Satan loses, right? Amen, right? <laughs> um. <clears throat> Turn to Acts chapter 17. Show you an example of how Paul dealt with the human wisdom. 
sure you're familiar with this. He's in Athens, and he's walking around, and he's seeing all these gods, right, all these different statues and, you know, shrines to them. You know, I was, I was looking the other day online at all these different Greek mythology and Greeks gods and goddesses. And if you ever looked at any of those, don't, don't spend too much time. It's, it's a joke. But, but you spend a little time looking at them, and you realize, see, that's, that's man's human wisdom of what God is. That is man saying, this is what I think God is. And all they think that is, is if I was God, this is what I would do. I'd be up there in the clouds and be partying and drinking and occasionally come down and get mad at a couple of humans and zap them. Maybe like a couple of humans and have a baby like Hercules. And then he can be like half God and zap them. And, you know, you know, there's like the stories of, of Poseidon. He came out and he struck a rock and water came out of it. Where do you hear about that in the Bible, right? You know, Zeus has a, a son, Hercules. He's half God, half man. I mean, you start reading all that stuff, where do you think they got all that from? Again, the Bible, right? I mean, it's a joke. So Paul sees all this, and he gets a little fired up about it. We're going to kind of break into the context of it here. Look at um, verse 22, Acts 17, 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that that in all things ye are too superstitious. Because all they, they got all these gods, right? Verse 23, For I have passed by and beheld your devotions. I found to an altar in this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Right? They're so concerned about making one of these gods upset that they're going to come down and zap them or you know, kill their crops right, or kill their kids or you know, not be able to have children anymore, that they just put up an altar to say, Just in case we missed one, here's, here's for you too, right? I mean, people look at the Bible, oh, you know, we don't believe that anymore, right? Humanity has grown since then, right? We don't have idols, right? We don't worship false gods. We don't have a Baal worship, right? We're not, we're not superstitious like any, that anymore. Baloney. Watch a, watch a sports game. Go watch baseball. What do you see those guys do in baseball before they go up to the plate? Pull out the cross, they kiss it, right? They got to tighten the gloves each time, right? And still superstitious. They just keep finding new ways to do it. That's all. And that's what Paul's saying. You, that's your wisdom? Your wisdom is maybe there's a God I don't know about, and I better, you know, take care of him just in case. So watch how he deals with them. Turn to chapter, uh, turn, uh, verse 30. So does Paul go at him and start using human wisdom? Does he start using philosophy? That's what these guys know, right? These guys are big shots in that. That's, what they, that's all they do. You know, we, we got colleges and universities today, and what, what, is, what are they called? Professors, right? What did Romans 121 say? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, right? Verse 30, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Th that's Romans 1. He goes right to Romans 1 on him, right? You can believe whatever you want about all these different gods. But there's a God, and he's going to judge you. So if you want to get judged according to your works, that's, that's up to you. But I'm telling you there's another way, right? Is that pretty simple? Now, what, what happens? Some, some look at him and like, ah, you're nuts. You believe in a re resurrection? You're cuckoo. But then what does some believe, right? But see, that's the, way you, that's the way you get people to believe. If you think that you're going to go to your own intellect and your own human wisdom and try to, try to do it the way the world does it to get people saved, you're just, you're just another form of the world. You're just another form of, form of human wisdom. So that's something we really need to be careful for. You know, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Anyone know what time I started? All right. I guess there's no one after me, so... You guys can go to sleep or walk out whenever you want, I guess. All right, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but, Jesus, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus Christ. What's he preaching? Christ, Christ crucified, right? 1 Corinthians 1.18, what's the power? Power of the cross, right? Verse 6, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. What did man do with their hearts? They darkened it, right? They professed themselves to be wise and became fools. 
Their foolish heart was darkened, right? Filled with the vanity of their own wisdom, their own knowledge, puffed up in what they believe. The only thing that gets through that is God's word. The light that shines in, that's it. In Hebrews, he says, the word is sharper than a two-edged sword, right? Mm-hmm. God's word's going to get through that. Not you reasoning them, not you going to their, going to what they're talking about and talking about evolution and thinking you're going to convince someone there's a God because you can try to make them disprove evolution. You show them that there's a God that created everything. And we're all sinners, and we all are in need of a Savior. And we can't do anything to save ourselves. But he, Praise the Lord, he came and did something for us. He sent his only son, right? And in 1 Corinthians 1, he talks about that. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of myself. No, nope. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. In Romans 11, it talks about how the Jews stumbled, right? The, the Jews see Paul go into the Gentiles and they say, you can't do that. We're God's chosen people, right? They see that and say, no, 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 no. They got to come through us, right? And you, you read in Romans and you, you see in, in chapter 9, 10, 11 there that there's, there's something new. Israel's been set aside. But you know what? Before that, did Israel have a chance before that? Did God just cut them off, right? They had a chance, right? What did they say about Jesus when he was on the earth in his earthly ministry? Remember, I think it's in Matthew. They're like, Jesus of Nazareth? You mean like his mother Mary? We know his brothers and his sisters. They're carpenters, right? Like that guy? He's from Nazareth? City of rejection? Like what did, what did human wisdom say about Jesus? Our king's not coming from that place. Our king's not coming from the ghetto, right? That's what they said. And to the Greeks, foolishness. The Greeks, they have their idea of what God is, Right? So you read Philippians 2 where it says that Christ was obedient, right? That he came and took upon himself the form of a man and became, became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. That's foolishness to them. You're telling me the God of the universe that created everything chose to come into mortal flesh, suffer, and die for his enemies? People who hated his guts? Why would you do that? You could have stayed up there and had a good time and partied, right? But see, that's man's, that's man's wisdom. That's how man's thinking about this in their head. Are you in 1 Corinthians 1? Okay. So let's move it along, I guess, here. Um, so he sums up all this human wisdom and, and man's, man's wisdom and God's wisdom, the difference between the two. And in verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. I want to look at those four things there. But he says, of him are ye in Christ. So he's like, why would you be focused on a man and his idea and, or yourself when who are you if you're a sanctified saint? How did you get sanctified? You're dead. Romans 6 says you're dead. So where are we found? In Christ, right? So don't glory in your flesh because you, your flesh is dead. You're in Christ now. When God hath made unto us wisdom, we already talked about God's wisdom, but turn to Colossians chapter 2. You know, in, in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, he starts to talk about the spiritual man now can perceive the, the spiritual things, right? Once you get saved, now you can, you can start to understand God's wisdom. You can start to grow in his wisdom, see his plans and his purpose. Colossians 2, verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All, right? Is there anything outside of God that you need to look for wisdom and knowledge to make you a better person, to make you happy, to find answers in your life? All, right? Verse 5, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith. So how does he want you to continue to grow? You find out about God's knowledge and his wisdom and all his riches he has for you in his word. That's it. It's your responsibility to do that, to grow in it. 
And then rooted in verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And then he goes into verse 8. We already read that. Beware, lest any man spoil you, right? Again, watch out. Don't, don't depart from the word. Don't depart from Paul's distinct message, his gospel, his epistles. Because that's going to spoil you. That's going to ruin you. How many of us have seen saints do that? Dear saints in the Lord, still saved, right? But where are they at now? Maybe they don't go to church. Shipwrecked, right? Maybe they, maybe they believe something else, right? It's sad. But what, what happens is they depart from God's word, they, specifically from Paul's, Paul's writings, right? <clears throat> He's made unto us righteousness, Romans chapter 3. Grab, hold, grab Philippians 3 because you're right by Colossians. Philippians 3 and Romans 3. Romans chapter 3 and Philippians chapter 3. Romans 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Paul's reminding the Corinthians, where's your righteousness at? How did you become saints? You didn't do anything. You didn't have to figure something out. You heard God's word and you believed it. You put your faith in what he did. And he accomplished everything. Christ accomplished everything. His death on the cross accomplished everything. But Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, Paul starts talking about his pedigree, right? Before he was saved. Was he a big shot? He knew some stuff, right? He was kind of a big deal. Had some money. Right? He's pretty high up on the ladder, right? People knew him. But he talks about what they, where that got him. Verse 8, he sums it up. Yea, countless, yea, doubtless, I counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. That's what he thinks of human wisdom. That's what he thinks of his righteousness what he can perform and do. Verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, through the faith of Christ and the righteousness which is of God by faith. Once you're saved, you know what? It's still the same thing. It's still God's righteousness. And as soon as you try to start performing in yourself, in your flesh, to do it, you're going back to yourself. And you're not staying with the truth. You are not walking by faith. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You're not doing that. Now you're trying to walk in your own power, in your own might. Uh, whom God hath made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. Grab 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Titus chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter six and Titus chapter three. I mentioned this in passing earlier. First Corinthians six verse verse nine. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And he lists all these horrible, horrible things, right? Verse nine, verse ten. But what does he sum it up with in verse eleven? But such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Right? What, what do we have to do with it again? In Titus 3, verse 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in the malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You think of Ephesians chapter 2. What were we before we were saved? Spiritually, we were dead. Not only were we dead, but who were we? we were the enemies of God, Right? We were fulfilling the lusts and the desires of ourselves, right? We were the children of disobedience. We were doing what we wanted to do. And what saved us? How did we get out of that and into Christ, right? How did we get set apart? How did we get sanctified? But after, verse 4, But after the kindness and love of God, our Savior, towards man appeared, 
not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing, the regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Again, where, where are we in this? What, what are we doing in our might and our power and our wisdom and understanding to accomplish this? We're not there. We're there, but, but our name's not there. Christ's name is there, right? And in 1 Corinthians 30, 1 verse 30, he says that we are found in him, right? We are in Christ, right? Whom has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and then redemption. If you look at, we're still in Titus chapter 2 verse uh, 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a future redemption to look forward to. Uh, turn to Ephesians 1. There are so many people today who are petrified, they're terrified that they don't know if they're saved forever. Mm-hmm. I grew up knowing that. I was fortunate. But you talk to people and they are terrified of that. They're concerned that maybe they, they did a sin that they don't know about or maybe that God won't forgive them for. Mm-hmm. And they're going to go to hell if they keep doing it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. How long are we sealed for? Forever, right? Until Christ comes and gets us, right? Until the catching away. We have a future redemption to look forward to. And there's nothing we can do to get out of it. We're stuck. And that's a good thing, right? So again, our redemption, what part do we have in making sure we're out of here during the rapture? Nothing, right? We're just sitting back and waiting, right? That's why in Titus he says looking, right, for that blessed hope. We can't wait to get out of here, right? (laughs) Sometimes we can't wait to get out of here, right? Romans 8, the groanings, right? Oh, man. Sometimes you just want to go. But then you remember 2 Corinthians 5, we're ambassadors for Christ. We got a purpose still. There's some work to get done. We need to continue to do that. Paul talked, uh, Alex talked about that a lot. All the guys did this week about how you don't, you don't faint. You saw Timothy, everyone, some left him in 1 Timothy, all left him in 2 Timothy, right? But you don't faint, you got to stick with it. I'll just, I'll close with this. I was just looking at, uh, did we ever do Jeremiah 20? Uh, Go to Jeremiah 9. We'll close there. I don't think we read this one yet. Jeremiah 9. In 1 Corinthians 1, he said, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who hath made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. According as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. We're in Christ, right? In 2 Corinthians 11:3, we find our simplicity. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled thee through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Our justification, Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. His love, Romans 8.39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Eternal security, Ephesians 2.6, and it raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Our hope, Paul, an apostle, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Victory. Now thanks be unto God, which has always caused us to triumph in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, our life. For in in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Our eternal purpose, Ephesians 1, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in all things in one, gather together in one all things in Christ. A new creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. His workmanship, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus that we should walk in them. Our needs, Philippians 4, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. 
Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things? Our spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And our comfort, Philippians 2, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, and the one we got above our head here, complete, and you are complete in him. So when you go through 1 Corinthians 1, what is Paul finishing it all up with? I mean, you go through that list. I mean, what else can you say? Amen, right? I mean, where do you fit into that? You're in Christ. Just rest in it. And so in verse 31 of uh, 1 Corinthians, he says that according to as it is written, and that's what we're reading in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delighteth, saith the Lord. Amen? All right. Lord, we thank you so much for your love. And uh, what a wonderful opportunity for us to to just be able to study your word whenever we want without any fear of being persecuted for it. And that's something that we take for granted. And uh, I just pray that we can continue to have that freedom. We thank you for your son and his all-sufficient sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And I just pray that we never forget to rest and trust in who we are in you and and your sufficiency for us, all-sufficient. We thank you for your love and your kindness. Amen. Thank you, man. Mm-hmm.